Hello, and welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Andrea Leinberger Jabari, a DPhil student in evidence based healthcare at the University of Oxford, and I'm also a researcher at New York University in Abu Dhabi. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at the University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterward, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much and hi everyone. Today we continue our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Jasmine Kucha entitled Estimating the Health Impact of Nicotine Exposure by Dissecting the Effects of Nicotine versus Non-Nicotine Constituents of Tobacco Smoke, a Multivariable Mendelian Randomization Study. This presentation was selected by a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Jasmine Kuja is a senior research associate in smoking studies at the University of Bristol, United Kingdom. Her work focuses on the causes and consequences of e-cigarette use, as well as the potential impact that e-cigarette policy changes could have on adult smokers, adult vapors, and young people. Using a range of methods, including novel methods in genetic epidemiology, she has explored a wide variety of topics, including the gateway hypothesis, possible health effects of vaping, and the potential impact of hypothetical e-liquid flavor bans. The overall aims of Dr. Kuja's research are to reduce health inequalities and to provide supporting evidence for policies and regulations that discourage smoking and protect young people from tobacco-related harm. Our discussant today is Dr. Leon Shahab, a professor of health psychology at University College London and co-director of the UCL Tobacco and Alcohol Research Group. Dr. Jasmine Kuja, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much. I will just share my slides. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm hoping this is going to be useful for people. Uh, it's a very complicated study, so I'm going to focus in on the methods and try and hopefully improve understanding of what is going on here. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors who are on screen at the minute as well. And I'd just like to start by uh, showing my disclosure slide. So we had funding for this project from the MRC, Medical Research Council in the UK, uh, specifically from the Inscritive Epidemiology Unit at the University of Bristol. And we also received funding from Cancer Research UK as well. And our authors were funded by Norwegian Southeastern Regional Health Authority and the ERC, European Research Council. And we also had some support from the National Institute for Health Research too. I have never received any tobacco related funding and there are no financial repercussions in publishing the opposite findings to what I'm showing today. And I would like to highlight that all the data and code are available on GitHub. And to start, I want to just highlight that I'm talking today about commercial tobacco rather than traditional or ceremonial tobacco. But commercial tobacco does cause, or tobacco smoking does cause cancer, at least 15 different types that we know of from Cancer Research UK on the right here, and more that are associated, but with less strong causal evidence. And we know it also causes poor health outcomes as well. And so far, the kind of uh, narrative in the UK has been that nicotine is not the harmful component of tobacco smoke. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to support this, but there has been some more discussion more recently about if that is true or not. 
And we know that the International uh, Agency for Research on Cancer doesn't classify nicotine itself as carcinogenic, whereas it does classify tobacco smoke as carcinogenic. But there's been implications that maybe nicotine might cause aggravation of cancer or recurrence of cancer. And there's also um, fears that nicotine may harm particularly adolescents in their um, learning and their affect. And um, there has been research published that nicotine use is associated with cardiovascular and respiratory outcomes. And I've highlighted the word associated here because there's very poor causal evidence of this. And nicotine use without tobacco via things such as vapes has been increasingly popular over the past few years. Um, and it's increasingly important as well because the UK in particular, the government have recently um, introduced or decided that they might introduce a vaping excise duty in which they propose a tiered rate based on nicotine. So you can see that no nicotine content e-liquids uh, would have a one pound duty versus up to 10.9 milligrams of nicotine would have a two pound um, duty and up to the 20 uh, and above 11 would have the three pound duty. And this could send the message that nicotine itself is harmful in higher doses, which isn't what we've necessarily seen in the literature. And so it's increasingly important to understand the impact of nicotine use. And I'm interested in um, trying to provide more evidence as to whether nicotine causes cancer and whether nicotine impacts lung and heart health, which is what we're focusing on in this study. Uh, but also we've looked into or looking into things like cancer survival, sleep, mental health um, and other outcomes as well. And as I said, there is previous research on the effects of nicotine, but a lot of it is focused on animal research where we might not be able to um, translate those findings into human outcomes. And much of the research is also focused on people who smoke or use tobacco, things like snus or um, smokeless tobacco. And so in those studies, we could be misinterpreting um, what is actually causing the effects. Is it the nicotine or is it the exposure to the other components of tobacco? And it's difficult to directly explore what nicotine is doing because we have limited longitudinal evidence from people who've only used nicotine without tobacco exposure. And that's because until kind of the advent of e-cigarettes, most people didn't use things like nicotine replacement therapies long term for their entire lives. So we haven't got that evidence to following someone up for that long to see if they develop these outcomes. And there are also, also ethical issues and practical issues of trying to conduct a Mendelian randomized control trial in this area, because given the hypothesis would be that nicotine might do harm, we would have to actively expose people who are not usually exposed to nicotine to nicotine, and for a long time as well, because we know that some of the outcomes of tobacco smoking take decades to actually occur. So we'd have to randomize people to an exposure which could harm them for decades and that would also take a long time. So the aim in this study was to explore the direct effects of nicotine compared with non-nicotine constituents of tobacco smoke uh, on smoking related health outcomes which included lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung function, coronary heart disease and heart rate. And we did that using genetic proxies and I'll explain over the next few slides why we did that. So when I say we use genetic variants as proxies, we did that in a uh, Mendelian randomization or MR framework. And this is a method that is often compared to a randomized control trial. So if we imagine that we are trying to set up an RCT of looking at whether increased smoking heaviness increases the risk of cancer diagnosis, we might take our population here who uh, could also have confounding factors in the population. So we might see that within our population, we have some people who drink alcohol and drinking alcohol is associated with um, smoking, but it's also associated with cancer diagnosis. So looking at those people, we might actually see that there is an effect that isn't really there. So what we would do in a randomized control trial is we would randomize these people to different groups assuming that um, there has been an equal chance of people having drunk alcohol in each of these groups or not drunk alcohol in each of these groups. 
And the groups would see increasing levels of exposure. So not smoking versus smoking one cigarette a day, two cigarettes a day, on and on. And in those increasing levels of exposure groups, we would expect to see in the bottom row here that you would see an increase in the cancer diagnoses in these different groupings. And so with Mendelian randomization, we have a similar framework, but what we do is we use the fact that people at conception are randomly assigned genetics from their father or their biological parents. And so they, randomly receive these genetics, which will then predict the likelihood that they will in, have certain outcomes or phenotypes, for example, the likelihood that they will smoke. And we do know that there are genetics associated with how much you will smoke. And so if we use these groupings, like use their genetics to say how likely someone is to smoke more heavily, we can look at whether those genetics are linked to our outcome and we would expect to see the same kind of pattern. So with increasing smoking heaviness, we see increased uh, smoking heaviness risk genetically, we would see increased risk of cancer diagnosis. And the interesting thing here is that because um, having a cancer diagnosis can't impact our genes, and because alcohol use can't impact our genes, we're not see, we won't see as much um, risk of confounding or risk of reverse causation. So in that, that way, we kind of uh, compare it to an RCT. However, there are assumptions that need to be met for a Mendelian randomization study to be appropriate. The first is that we need an instrument, which is made up of the genetic variants which predict our exposure. And we need that, those, that instrument to actually be associated with our exposure. And this is the relevance assumption. The second assumption is that there's no measured, sorry, unmeasured or unaccounted for confounding between the instrument and the outcome, which is the independence assumption. And that's denoted by the dotted line at the top. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. And the third assumption is that there is uh, the association between the genetic variance and the outcome is entirely via the exposure. So we shouldn't see this dotted line at the bottom, whereby the genetic variance predicts the outcome without having an impact on uh, through the exposure. And this can happen. This is called pleiotropy, where some genetic variants will um, be associated with multiple um, phenotypes. So for the first assumption, we need to check that our genetic variants are actually associated with what we think they're trying to measure. And for that, they use genome-wide association studies in which they look at the uh, phenotype of interest or the behavior of interest, and they say what on the DNA is actually linked to um, an increased risk of having that. And so we pick out the genetic variants from genome-wide association studies to make sure we meet the first assumption. And in the second assumption, um, the independence assumption, there are three main things that we might be concerned about. First is population stratification or structure. And this is where people from subgroups within a population may be more likely to share the same genetics, but may coincidentally be more likely to also have the same increased risk to it and exposure. Um, so that can make the link between the genetics and the phenotype or the um, exposure of interest look more strong than it actually is. Second is intergenerational effects. And this is where, because your parents and yourself will share genetics, if your parents do things that might impact your health, for example, smoking during your pregnancy, it may, may look that there isn't look like there is an impact of um, smoking, your own smoking on health, when actually it's the impact of your parental behavior on your health. So that's a, a potential, um, potentially something that could introduce confounding back into the model. And third, there's associative mating, uh, which is a similar issue where people who uh, are more similar to each other are more likely to mate with each other and therefore we have similar genetics and similar phenotypes um, coming together and that can also create a link between the um, un unmeasured confounding and the genetics. So these are quite complicated concepts 
please don't worry if you're not understanding those. Uh, they take a while to get your head around. But essentially, there are things we can do if we think that independence could be a potential issue here. We can use methods like multivariable MR. And for the third assumption, I mentioned that pleiotropy, so where genetic variants might predict more than one um, phenotype. And here we can use many methods that have been developed to account for pleiotropy. So things such as MR Eger, weighted median, weighted mode, which is some of the most commonly used methods. Uh, there are many, many more, loads and loads of methods coming out in the minute. Um, but these methods often lack power versus the traditional inverse variance weighted method. So um, what we often do is we use all of these methods and compare across them to triangulate to see are the results that we get consistent in terms of, are they saying that we've got an effect in the same direction? And if the um, pleiotropy robust methods might have less precise confidence estimates, then we are less concerned as long as they're in the same direction and in the same kind of region of estimate as the inverse variance weighted method. So, I'm going to pause here and ask the questions because that is a really complex methodology that takes like three days to explain properly. So if anyone has any questions, um, be happy to hear them. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And thank you so much for explaining a very complicated thing to us very, very clearly. I'll first hand over to Leon to see if you have any comments or questions at this point. And I'd encourage our audience to put any questions they might have in the Q&A function. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Jamie and Jasmine. Um, a very good explanation of uh, Mendelian randomization. I had uh, two questions that people may ask. And um, the first one is, um, in this um, framework, how do you deal with epigenetic effects? Um, is there is that cu captured within the independence assumption? So the epi... Oh, do you want me to answer that? Oh, wait for the second yeah. question. So the epigenetic effects are something that happens downstream of your genetics. And for those that don't know what epigenetics are, it's essentially your DNA won't change, but you can change how your DNA might be interpreted. So it can turn genes on or off, and that can impact kind of the proteins that get developed and therefore impact on things like health outcomes and other behaviors. But because epigenetics are downstream of your DNA and your genetic um, likelihood of doing something, it's kind of captured in that, um, it's captured in that it's, it would be downstream and a vertically pleiotropic association, if that makes sense, Leon. Um, so because it would impact along the pathway, it's okay. If it was impacting something else, that would be the, the issue. Okay. So epigenetics aren't usually a problem, a problem within these analyses, essentially. And then the other question is, and sorry, it's a bit of a technical question, but it's about pleiotropy. Um, you obviously in your paper refer to different types of pleiotropy. Um, there's directional um, pleiotropy, there's uh, horizontal, and there's vertical, as you just mentioned. Yeah. And with regards to, and you might come on to discuss it in more detail with regards to this particular paper, I'm, I'm interested in how you deal with indirect uh, uh, horizontal pleiotropy, i.e. Um, uh, the effects of two sets of uh, SNPs, for instance, varying with one another and working through different characteristics. So um, I think the technical term for it is, uh, uh, what's it called, linkage disequilibrium. Um, and the question I have is, whether in this particular paper that you present data on, this was assessed at all and how that was dealt with. Is, this, is it captured in the various methods you mentioned there, the MR, EGA, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so actually um, linkage disequilibrium is usually captured in all MR methods. So when we select the genetic variants to put into the model, we don't just select everything that comes out because there are genetic variants which lie close to each other and more likely to have kind of the same effect. And so because of that, we try and just take the top SNP, the most influential SNP, so that's a genetic variant, in um, that region, because otherwise we might overestimate the effect by having multiple genetic variants, which are predicting the same thing uh, included in the model. So we um, do ensure that we clump the SNPs, uh, the genetic variants, so that we only take kind of the lead um, genetic variant, which is having an effect. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I just wondered how you assess that, though, because by what you're saying there, of course, is that you're looking for, you know, very strong signals, you know, Manhattan plot, et cetera, and to identify yeah. SNPs that are particularly strongly associated. But are mm -hmm. there any kind of other methods that people use to look if you find a particular SNP that is very strongly associated to see whether it is, it, it might be, you know, causing this kind of indirect uh, horizontal pleiotropy? Is there any ways of assessing it? I mean, you might not know that, and that's perfectly fine. I just wondered out of interest. Yeah, right. now I'm just um, trying to remember the word of the um, test that you can do, that R test that you can do. It's not particularly okay. relevant for this one. It's usually most relevant for drug target testing. Um, and if I remember it, I will mention it in the next break or after the next question. <laughs> but I should that's great. It. Thanks so much. Okay. That's all for me for now. Thank you both so much. We don't have anything in the Q&A yet. Please do put them in as Jasmine's talking, but over to you, Jasmine. Thank you. So we've learned about this really complex methodology now. Um, let's apply our main question to it. So if I was gonna draw out the model of what this would look like, we would need genetic variants for nicotine, which lead to increased nicotine exposure which uh, we would then look at the impact of those um, genetic variants on health. And we would assume that we'd accounted for these unmeasured confounders. So the difficulty here is that many of you who work with nicotine will know that nicotine is metabolized very quickly into cotinine. And because of this, we don't really have good studies or genome-wide association studies, which have identified those genetic variants which um, are associated with nicotine. But what we do have are the genetic variants which are associated with cotinine, that metabolite of nicotine. And so it may, would make sense to try and use this in our model instead of the nicotine genetic variants. But unfortunately, we don't think that cotinine will have the same effect on health as nicotine would. And so that first assumption that we needed that the genetic variants will impact the outcome via the exposure that we're um, uh, proxying, that wouldn't be met if we just used cotinine here. So instead, we looked at what else we could use in our model. And some of you may be familiar with the nicotine metabolite ratio. And this is a ratio of how quickly someone will uh, metabolize nicotine into cotinine. So it's causally impacting how much nicotine will be in your system given how much you've kind of uh, taken into your body. And we actually have genetic variants for the nicotine metabolite ratio or NMR. And because it causally impacts nicotine, this is something that we thought we could use in our model. But for anyone that has worked with nicotine metabolite ratio, they will know that this is more complicated than it first seems. So if a person has a higher nicotine metabolite ratio, they will metabolize nicotine more quickly than a person with lower nicotine metabolite ratio. So if they both smoke the same amount of cigarette smoke, inhaling the same amount of nicotine into their systems, person A will likely clear nicotine into cotinine quicker than person B. And that's denoted by the black dots being nicotine and the white dots being cotinine here. So at time point three, despite having the same amount of nicotine exposure at the beginning, person A has less nicotine in their system than person B. However, because person A has cleared all of their nicotine from their system, they're more likely to be experiencing nicotine withdrawal and will more likely smoke more. So they will then introduce more nicotine in their system before person B introduces more nicotine in their system. So when we're looking at the nicotine metabolite ratio, it's actually unclear in terms of how much nicotine might be in their system because it depends on how much they've smoked. And we actually use this to our advantage. And apologize that this is a little bit of a um, messy slide here. It's a, there's a lot going on, but this is a model of multivariable Mendelian randomization. And multivariable man Mendelian randomization is a method in which we can actually include two or more exposures into our model. And when we include um, those other exposures, what we're doing is we can look at the effect of one exposure whilst accounting for the other exposures in our model. And so here, what we're doing is we're looking at the effect of the nicotine metabolite ratio, but then we're accounting for how many cigarettes are smoked per day by including the genetic variants for how many cigarettes are smoked per day as well. Um, so what we get out of this model 
is an estimate of how much circulating nicotine someone might have in their body and the impact of that on uh, smoking related health outcomes. And we also get an estimate of how the non nicotine constituents of tobacco smoke, smoke might be impacting our health outcomes. And you'll see in the middle here, there's this kind of circular effect um, in which circulating nicotine, if you have lower levels, um, then you're more likely to smoke more cigarettes per day. And then if you, uh, or more cigarettes, for, for example, and if you have smoked more cigarettes, you'll have more circulating nicotine. And what this model kind of does is kind of take out that um, circular effect. So... In this model, we are using the multivariable Mendelian randomization technique, and we are using summary level genome wide association data. So that's data from genome wide association studies by the GSCAN consortium, uh, who've uh, got a measure of cigarettes per day and the genetic variants associated with those. And we've also got the NMR or nitium metabolite ratio GWAS from Buckwald as well. And um, so those are the exposures that we use in here. And just quickly before I move on, I'm going to plug Eleanor Sanderson's paper here, who um, if you're interested in multivariable Mendelian randomization, this is a very clear um, paper that you can read up on more on that. And in terms of our outcomes, we used UK Biobank data to look at lung function. Uh, that was forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume in one second. We also looked at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and coronary heart disease, as well as heart rate. And we looked at lung cancer in the International Lung Cancer Consortium, also known as ILCO. And you'll notice here in brackets that I've got um, some stratification. So ever current form or never. Um, and we stratified our data um, by these different categorizations because the genetic variants identified were identified in ever and current smokers. So they're only really meaningful in that population of people. The data, the information that we get from them is only relevant to them. And so what we do in our analyses is when we have binary diagnoses, and um, we've explored these in ever smokers, so that is coronary obstructive pulmonary disease, coronary heart disease and lung cancer. And we've done this because people might quit after a diagnosis. So we feel like ever smokers are probably more relevant to look in terms of outcomes here. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, for acute outcomes that might change, they might only be um, relevant in the current smokers. And so that's for uh, the lung function and heart rate as well. We've looked at those. We also did look at former smokers to see if there's any recoverable effects. And we double checked that our analyses were working essentially in the never smokers, because what we would expect is if we find an effect among never smokers, for which we shouldn't see an effect because there should be no effect that's not going through smoking um, or nicotine exposure, um, that would indicate there's something wrong if we see that in the never smokers. And again, just a quick pause, just in case anyone has any further questions. Great, thank you so much. Again, over to Leon. So I only have uh, three quick questions, relatively quick. The first one is about, um, you mentioning at the uh, beginning then that we're not really interested so much in the effects of cotinine on health outcomes, but nicotine. Can mm -hmm. you just explain why that is? Uh, presumably you're talking about metabolic pathways there, but um, it would be helpful if you could just explain to the audience why we wouldn't be interested in cotinine as opposed to nicotine, given that you also obviously in your paper, in fact, use cotinine as one indicator. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we used it basically to show that it probably wasn't a good measure. Um, and partly, so the reason that we don't think that cotinine will be on that pathway to our outcome here is that it's cotinine measured in urine. So it's excreted. So it's also that like, cotinine within the bladder is probably not going to be having effects around the body. Um, so that's one kind of issue with what cotinine, um, why we wouldn't want to use cotinine. The other issue is that um, cotinine doesn't seem to have the same properties as nicotine in terms of the effect it might have. Like we don't have the neurological effects from cotinine. Those are all from the nicotine. So nicotine is a much more active um, component in, in uh, the body compared to, to cotinine. So 
And it, if it does, I think there is some evidence that codeine does kind of have some impact on the body, but it looks like it's a different impact. So what we might be measuring is something that is not actually nicotine. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also the other thing I would probably add is to that, of course, that nicotine is involved in uh, the production of, or depending on the metabolic pathways of uh, tobacco cystic nitrosamines. And so you yes. wouldn't be able to get a handle on that uh, with cochinine. So nicotine is probably more helpful if you are looking for cancer, cancer, uh, carcinogenic yeah. effects. The Absolutely. other question I had is, um, you obviously include heart rate uh, as a positive mm -hmm. control because based yeah. on the literature, we assume that there would be an impact of nicotine on the heart rate. Did you consider mm -hmm. any other positive controls? And I was thinking in particular here about insulin resistance, because there's quite good evidence that nicotine is associated with that. Um, did you consider it? And uh, if not, was it because there were no data available on it? Or if it is available, then I would suggest you might also look at that. <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't consider it, actually. And um, that's an interesting one. I'll have to look to see if it's available, because it's not just that we need it to be available. We need a GWAS to have been run on it, and we need that GWAS to be stratified by smoking. Um, so there is some difficulty there. But I can look into that, actually. That would be an interesting uh, one to do. I'll follow up with you offline about that one, I think. <laughs> And then the last quick question, and I think you do address this in your paper, it, obviously using it's a very clever methodology that you're using here to dissociate the effects of non-nicotine non constituents and nicotine um, mm -hmm. with the um, genetic instruments for NMR and um, heaviness of smoking. One thing people might say is, of course, that um, the effects of having a, uh, have a high nicotine metabolism is that you also not only smoke more cigarettes, but you also might smoke them differently i.e. Mm. that it affects your puffing topography. This is something that isn't necessarily captured in this design. And yeah. of course, the way that you smoke a cigarette may independently be associated with various outcomes. So I wondered yeah. if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so we, we do address in the kind of paper that there, there could be other elements of smoke exposure because cigarettes per day isn't a an all consuming measure it doesn't really capture everything so there could be that um extra noise in the data um however the the nicotine element of this research um that's a really strong instrument we have for nicotine metabolism which metabolism which should be very specific to nicotine um so we're more confident in the nicotine results than the smoking heaviness uh, sorry the the results which are related to the other constituents of tobacco smoke. But I can go into that more when we're in the results. Thank you so much. Let's hear the results. Great, thank you. So just very briefly, just giving you a bit of an idea of the numbers in terms of our outcomes. Um, so we had 40,187 ever smokers who had lung cancer, uh, sorry, who didn't 57% of whom had lung cancer. Uh, those were in the International Lung Cancer Consortium. We had 9,859 never smokers in that consortium and 24% of those um, had lung cancer. In UK Biobank, we had 213,341 ever smokers, 49,721 current smokers, and 163,620 former smokers. I'll just highlight that the current and former smokers, they're grouped to form the ever smoking group. And the never smokers, we had 258,056. Uh, in terms of coronary heart disease, the case rate was similar across the smoking groups and lower in the never smokers, as you'd expect. Uh, for coronary obstructive pulmonary disease, um, there was a higher rate in the current smokers and in the former smokers and ever smokers compared to the never smokers. Um, and in terms of lung function, that was actually fairly similar across groups, but we do see very small changes in lung function. And in terms of heart rate, uh, it was slightly higher in the current smokers, but again, it's fairly similar. And I touched upon this earlier in terms of instrument strength. So we do do a double check to make sure that the genetic variants that we are using are actually strongly enough associated with the exposure that we're using in the model. And in multivariable Mendelian randomization, we do an extra check to check that it's still strong when we're accounting for the other exposure that we've included in the model. And using a conditional F statistic, we can test this. And F statistics above 10 would indicate that it's a strong instrument. And all of our F statistics were above 30. So we're confident that they were strong instruments here. 
Um, I'll highlight before I show you the actual results, how to interpret the results in terms of nicotine metabolite ratio. So when we're just looking at the univariable MR, by which I mean the, the Mendelian randomization where we've not accounted for smoking heaviness, in this analysis, the nicotine metabolite ratio result is quite ambiguous because we don't know if it's more smoking or if it's um, less nicotine. However, in the multivariable Mendelian randomization results, the NM, the higher the NMR score indicates the lower nicotine exposure that the person will have. And so we flip the estimates. So if you see for the NMR results in the NVMR results, uh, an odds ratio, for example, of 1.2, that would usually indicate, indicate an increased um, risk. But here it indicates, indicates decreased risk of the outcome with increased nicotine exposure. And I'll highlight those points as we go through. So these are the binary outcomes among ever smokers. And here we see that nicotine exposure does not appear to cause coronary heart disease with the confidence intervals crossing the null here. And it does not appear to cause COPD either. And it does not appear to cause lung cancer, which was our negative control. And interestingly, what we see here is that all of the results are just above these boxes. We do see that there might be some kind of indication in COPD and lung cancer particularly of it would have indicated if we hadn't controlled for smoking heaviness that nicotine metabolize, uh, the nicotine metabolite ratio was increasing risk. But as soon as we accounted for smoking heaviness, then the estimates went to the null. And what we'll see is in the smoking heaviness results, so how many cigarettes smoked per day, under the dotted lines, you'll see that the effects weren't reduced to the null when nicotine was accounted for. And looking at the continuous outcomes for current smokers, nicotine exposure does not appear to cause poor lung function. And interestingly here, remember I said that we need to flip the results when it, when it comes to NMR, if we're thinking about nicotine exposure. So this actually indicates a very weak, small potential um, effect, a protective effect of nicotine on lung function. But as I said, it's, it's very weak, so we wouldn't really trust too much into that, especially when you compare it to what smoking heaviness is doing underneath. And nicotine does not, uh, sorry, does appear to cause increased heart rate as we expect. It was our um, control. Interestingly, here under the smoking heaviness results, we do see that even accounting for nicotine, it does appear that the other constituents of um, tobacco smoke might be having an impact on heart rate. And that's kind of logical. I mean, where if you're smoking, you're putting a lot of different things in your body, which could be doing harm, and your heart rate is probably increasing to adapt to that and try and. Um, keep yourself healthy. In terms of our seventh sensitivity analyses, we did look at never smokers, as I said, and we didn't want to see any effects here, but we did find some uh, in the smoking heaviness analyses, indicating that there could be some potential pleiotropy or population stratification. And that's what we were just discussing with Leon there, that there could also be that there is some kind of leftover residual effects that we've not accounted for um, here. And we didn't affect, found any effects of never smokers in the nicotine metabolite ratio. And so this is good. This is basically saying in the analyses where we're interpreting the effects of nicotine, we're not seeing any evidence of issues with pleiotropy or population stratification for the nicotine metabolite ratio. Among former smokers, we did um, find findings that suggest there are likely lasting detrimental effects of smoking, but these don't seem to be attributable to nicotine exposure. And the effects um, seen in the univariable MR, where we didn't account for smoking heaviness, attenuated to the null. Um, so we, we didn't see those effects once we accounted for smoking heaviness in the multivariable Mendelian randomization. And I've just got a couple of bonus results, which I think we have time for. Um, so this is some work that we've been doing with Chloe Burke as lead. Um, so we have looked at major depressive disorder as an outcome as well. Um, and she's just released this um, preprint and submitted to addiction. And here she found some weak evidence to suggest that nicotine could increase risk of major depressive disorder, but it is weak evidence and it is a small effect size. 
And there's more clear evidence that the other constituents of tobacco smoke are actually um, could actually be driving this effect. Um, so even if nicotine does seem to have an impact on um, depression, it seems like if you switch to a non-tobacco form of nicotine, you could still be decreasing risk um, of depression. And we've also done some work on sleep, which is just in the right up stage at the minute. Um, interesting results here. We found that people who had greater nicotine exposure per cigarette were more likely to be an evening person. They're more likely to find it harder to get up in the morning, less likely to nap, less likely to have narcolepsy and more likely to sleep for longer. And these kind of indicated that nicotine may be helpful to stay awake, which aligns with nicotine being a stimulant. But um, it might mean that maybe nicotine is not good for sleep quality, even if you're sleeping less or uh, staying awake more. And this might be have be being impacted by um, the impact of nicotine withdrawal. So these are findings that we're kind of really considering at the moment. So other than that, um, limitation of uh, effects may be being impacted by nicotine withdrawal, which I don't think should impact the main results that I just presented. There is a potential limitation of collider bias being introduced because we stratified our data based on smoking status. And there are potential pleiotropy issues um, and issues due to stratification of the population, but those seem to be limited to the results for smoking heaviness. Um, and we seem to be, we're fairly confident in the nicotine results. Uh, we were unable to use non-European data um, or non-European ancestry data, um, which is a real shame because we do have some good non-European ancestry data in the G-Scan consortium. However, we didn't have that available for the nicotine metabolite ratio, and we need all of our um, data in the model to be comparable for it to work in the model. Um, there was also in the nicotine metabolite ratio G was an adjustment for BMI, um, and this could have an impact on any analyses where BMI is a plausible covariate, and that is uh, particularly true of things like coronary heart disease. So we, we might want to be a little bit um, cautious about the effects that we're seeing there. In terms of future work, we are currently looking at psychotic experiences, cognitive outcomes, including things like Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease. And I am looking at cancer progression as well and head and neck cancer as well as lung cancer. We are open to collaboration. So if anyone's interested in working on this or has any suggestions for other outcomes like Leon did earlier, um, please do let us know with the caveat that we do need to have the outcomes stratified by smoking status and we need to have the genetic variants that are associated with those among those stratifications. And just a plug for Bristol short courses. So I am from uh, Bristol in the United Kingdom, and we do offer some short courses here, including Mendelian randomization and advanced Mendelian, Mendelian randomization. So please go to the website if you're interested in learning more. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you to my collaborators and all the students that have worked on these projects as well. Thank you so much, Jasmine. What a beautiful picture of Bristol there at the end as well. Uh, over to you first, Leon, and please do put in questions in the Q&A if you have them. Okay, well, um, congrats um, on this study. Very impressive, Jasmine. Um, and on the whole, producing results that we expected. Um, yeah. Obviously, one point I want to make again is that uh, the, the odd finding, I call it odd finding, of a protective effect of nicotine, greater nicotine, on uh, lung function, uh, mm -hmm. as I say, is probably most likely explained by the effect of uh, of intensity, the way that people inhale nicotine yeah. if they have a lower uh, nicotine metabolite uh, ratio. I would have thought. Um, I I had a question about the the cardiovascular outcomes in general. They don't seem to produce quite as clear cut results and. I'm wondering whether you want to think a bit about the problem there, which is, of course, uh, you look at ever smokers because people might be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease and therefore stop smoking. But then, mm -hmm. of course, the other thing is that unlike for lung cancer, the risk of cardiovascular diseases uh, is reversible. So, you know, you yeah. don't get stuck at a certain level of risk. And so it can become quite difficult, I think, to disentangle this in this kind of analysis. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think I have done the current um, smokers as well. Um, but I think the, the biggest issue is not necessarily what we've done, but it's in UK Biobank. And we've seen in Mendelian randomization before in other studies, 
uh, looking at um, smoking and coronary heart disease, that they've similarly not seen very strong effects. Um, and so it could be that I, we have a fairly healthy population within UK Biobank, and there are many causes of coronary heart disease. So it may just be that within UK Biobank, we have few cases of coronary heart disease that are actually caused by smoking. And if we opened it up to a healthier population uh, and a more normal population, more average population, we may see bigger effects there as well. But I do think that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, but I think I think in our supplementary, we do have the current smokers as well. I'll double check I think on that it, and maybe. I think it also doesn't produce the results you'd expect, I think, because yeah. of the fact, as I say, that people don't necessarily stop smoking until they have a diagnosis. So you might not be see it in current smokers either. Yeah, and... which is, we have the former smokers as well. And I, I think it was an odd finding in, in all of the groups from what I remember. Now, one question I had is, and I think it's uh, probably important because of um, your introduction when you talk about the concerns we have about nicotine as it's pre as it's delivered now primarily to youth through yes. e-cigarettes, is of course that this this methodology does enable you to differentiate the effects of nicotine and other con constituents in tobacco smoke when they're delivered together. But there might be interactive effects between nicotine itself and the other components. And that is, I think, very difficult, even with this kind of analysis, to differentiate. I mean, do you have any thoughts about this? I mean, if you, if you were to run an ideal study, what would it be to mm. evaluate the effects of nicotine? Gosh, I mean, I wouldn't want to run the randomized, uh, randomized control trial because I don't want to hurt <laughs> people. Um, I think this is a really difficult area and it's not about finding the perfect study. It's about triangulating across loads yep. and loads of different methods and seeing if we get the same result from all the different methods with the different biases. I think there, there is no perfect way to do this on our maps. Not, absolutely not saying this is the perfect way and this is the answer to all of our nicotine questions. It's just another tool that's not been used yet to add to all of the other evidence that we have and to make us a little bit more sure about what we're saying to the public. Yeah, and I should probably plug that that Bristol is obviously leading in uh, in this particular idea of triangulation, meaning that you set up projects right from the start with using different types of methodology, including MR, but also possibly observational uh, other observational data analysis and maybe experimental uh, uh, studies that have all of different types of biases, but which are not correlated. So meaning that if you find a result that's consistent across these different types of studies, with different biases is unlikely to be driven by these biases and therefore more likely to give you an accurate result, which I think is a very good idea going forward. I had one last question before I hand over to others, and this is more about people who might not be so much aware of MR, Mendelian randomization, about that field as a whole. Um, obviously, George Davies Smith, who has sort of invented this field, um, has of late come out uh, with you know some concerns about it because of the fact that there are many more studies being published now, uh, quite a few of which produce clearly spurious results um, that aren't really um, reliable or make any sense, you know, have very little face validity. But then also, you know, you're using here multivariate um, Mendelian randomization. So the, the uh, analyses become more and more complex, make it even difficult for some of the co-authors probably to understand what is going on. So mm -hmm. I just wondered, uh, as a tool, uh, what 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 things would you, you know, suggest for this field moving forward to increase the validity of results uh, or reliability of results or decrease you know, spurious findings being reported. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, so this has been a very big topic at Bristol. Um, and I recently went to the Mendelian randomization conference and huge, huge topic there. Um, essentially, we've made Mendelian randomization very easy to conduct. And so that has allowed a lot of people that don't necessarily understand all the intricacies of the models to use Mendelian randomization and publish studies, which might, well, which shouldn't have been run in the first place because they've not met all the assumptions. They've not considered all of the nuances and the sources of bias that should be considered when they're doing that. Um, so I'd say Mendelian randomization is a fantastic tool and it is very helpful for things like triangulation. It is not the be all and end all in terms of if we find something in MR that is definitely correct. It's just one, one estimate in a range of other estimates from different um, studies that you should use. And I would also recommend if you want to do Mendelian randomization, do a course. 
uh, actually train yourself and uh, ideally talk to someone who is an expert as well. There are plenty of them at Bristol University. I'm happy to put people in touch with people if they're interested in, in doing MR. Oh, that's great. And, and lastly, one quick thing I want to say, I'm very interested in your idea of looking at cancer progression because, uh, I mean, to make others aware, of course, uh, nicotine is not currently an IR carcinogen, mm -hmm. um, but there have been studies that have shown certainly in animal models that it may influence anti-tumor uh, um, immune response uh, or propagate tumor progression. So once a tumor has yeah. been, is in situ, it may be actually, uh, you know, spread more easily because of nicotine being present. So I think it's a very interesting study to look at that. Um, yeah. Very happy to collaborate on it, I would say as well. But oh, that's, I'll uh, get in touch. It's really horribly <laughs> complicated, so <laughs> I'll Great. definitely get in touch. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Leon, for your wonderful questions and comments. And now I'm going to pull from our Q&A as well. So a question here from Lisa Sloan. How can your findings advise vaping policy? That's a great question. Um, so in that particular policy that I spoke up to at the beginning, where they are increasing duty based on nicotine level, I would say that the evidence that we have from this study doesn't support that. And you could be increasing misperceptions of nicotine harm if you do have a duty that's based on the level of nicotine that's, that's in a product. So that is, is one way. Um, in general, Although I initially designed this study to tell us something about vaping, because that was my primary interest, and we can't do a GWAS of vape, or can't do an MR study of vaping because we don't have the genetic data to allow us to do that yet. Um, although I wanted to do that, this is restricted to the impact of nicotine because vaping comes with a whole host of other constituents of its own, and we don't know what those do from this analysis. Um, so if you're looking at any policies that are looking at the nicotine and trying to demonize nicotine, essentially, I feel like that this is useful for those policies, um, but specifically the harms of vaping, we can only say so much. Great. Thank you. Would another question here, would you consider comparing the effect with nicotine replacement therapies as a way to isolate the impact of nicotine on its own? Yeah, so, I mean, in general, we would do that observationally, like that's been done observationally, but it's been done really short term. I am not aware of any, so it's difficult because you, if you were gonna put this into a nicotine, um, into an MR model, you would need a GWAS of nicotine replacement therapy use. And I'm not sure that would make sense because it's usually used quite short term. Um, and I'd have to really think about, again, like, as we were saying with Leon, we don't wanna just run the analyses without thinking about exactly what the impact is and whether it makes sense on the causal pathways. Um, if it's a very limited use, we might not, might not pick that up in the genetics, we might just pick up whether they were a smoker, because most of the people that use nicotine replacement therapy were smokers. And so it would be picking up smoking rather than nicotine replacement therapy use in an MR model. Observationally, yes, it's absolutely something that has been done short term. Um, and I think there's little more studies as well of nicotine replacement therapy, slightly longer term in people that have smoked, but we don't see that in people that have never smoked. And that's really what you would need to get rid of the confounding from other uh, from the constituents of tobacco. Great, thank you. And do you know if there's any plans to look at type two diabetes or pancreatic cancer in this space? Not yet, but I'm adding it to my list now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a question here from Mike Pesco. You said that there are no effects of nicotine on many health outcomes. There's some kind of confidence interval around those results. Would you describe those results as precise zeros or do the confidence intervals include potentially relevant effects in either direction? And are those confidence intervals able to rule out effects as large as the average effects found in the non-causal clinical literature? It's a mouthful, I can break it down. Yeah, that is a mouthful, and I'm, I'm not sure I took all of it in, um, but essentially, so where he was asking about specifically the confidence intervals confidence in intervals. where we haven't seen effects, yeah. or where we have, have seen effects. Well, we haven't seen effects. Um, we have do have some precise confidence intervals, particularly for the lung function. Um, 
there are a few where we see wider confidence intervals um but often the estimate was close to the null as well it wasn't just that it was like they were spanning across and it was all the fx estimate was really far across it was just huge confidence intervals it was mostly that we did see a shift from um let's see if i can actually show you an example so you kind of see this shift when we include uh nicotine in the model probably not a good one actually because the lung function is so tiny <laughs> but here we see these shifts as well in the effect size it's not just that the uh confidence intervals are getting wider it's we we see the actual shift in the effect size when we include um smoking heaviness so yeah i don't think the confidence intervals are wide enough that we would be assuming like they, they almost get more precise in some of the, the estimates as well. So I think we can be fairly confident in, in that it's not just that we're adding kind of noise. Right. And I think that answered the question, but it was a long question. <laughs> like first two thirds of the question. And then the last element of it was basically, I think I might know the answer to this, but I'm going to pose it to you having looked at this, are the confidence intervals kind of narrow enough to rule out some of the effect sizes or the associations that we've seen reported in the, in the non-causal literature for some of these outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to compare it to a specific <laughs> study, yeah. but I would say, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got quite tight confidence intervals for most of these results. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any more Q&A questions. We do have probably time for one more, but I'm going to take my privilege here as the moderator and ask just a little bit more. I know you said it; it's not currently feasible, but if you're able to comment on it, is there kind of any hope on the horizon that we might end up finding something where we'd be able to run GWAS studies based on other constituents of vaping as opposed to nicotine, or is that still a way off? Fantastic question. I love this. Um, so we're actually currently trying to get off the ground a meta was of vaping so we are going to open up so many doors if we can do that where i'm currently working with our future health who got a lot of data on vaping uh, and genetic data so that will open up the avenues massively and we'll be able to do a mendelian randomization of vaping and smoking in a multivariable analysis I'm so excited. So oh, excited. Just keep going. <laughs> That's brilliant news. Oh, yay. Music to my ears. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions in the q and I'm going to say thank you very much to Jasmine and Leon and hand over to Andrea to close us out. Great. Thank you, Jamie. So it looks like we're out of time. Um, however, if you do still have some burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Kuja, you can join us for top of the tops, um, which is an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select tops events this season. So to join, um, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat um, and uh, switch rooms with us once the event concludes. We'll leave this webinar room open for um, an extra minute at the end so that everyone has a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. So also I'd like to thank our presenter, um, our moderator and discussant. And also finally, thank you to the audience of 110 people today for your participation and have a tops notch weekend. <laughs>